Hi everybody! We are going to be doing chapter 10 now and there's two market structures, the last two that we are going to cover, the first of which is monopolistic competition. Okay, so this is what it sounds like. It's a combination of perfect competition and monopoly. So it has characteristics from both. Uh, let's go through them. What are they? First, there are many buyers and sellers, so that means it's like perfect competition, lots of people participating in the market. But what's different um, than perfect competition is it's a differentiated product, meaning you can tell the difference between one company's product versus the other. There is brand loyalty as a result, and um, there's some reason to do advertising because that gives firms control over their brand and uh, makes it so that people want to buy their product. So we see advertising in this type of market structure, and this is much more realistic, right? This is fast food, this is jeans, tennis shoes, energy drinks. This is what we see when we go down the aisle in a grocery store. Uh, there are no barriers to entry or exit, so that's similar to perfect competition, and think about it, that's gonna give us some um, idea of what will happen in the long run, basically zero economic profits, um, and that's what we've got here, no long, run economic profits. Okay, with those characteristics in mind, let's go ahead and do what it looks like. Ooh, I can see that this is going to be hard. Sorry. Um, with this, let me see if I can move it. There we go. Sorry, bear with me, folks. Okay, so a monopolistically competitive firm faces a downward sloping demand curve, much like we derived for a monopoly. This is the market. They're not taking the prices given. There's not a perfectly elastic demand curve like in perfect competition but it's going to be relatively flat. It's not like a monopoly that has any elastic demand. There's no substitutes uh, for that firm's product. There are many other buyers and sellers, well, in this case, sellers, so it is a relatively flat demand curve. And remember, marginal revenue always bisects the area below the demand curve. Therefore, we see it relatively flat and below. So how do we profit maximize? It's going to be similar. What we do is we have, where does our marginal revenue equals our marginal cost? Right there, that would be the quantity we produce at. We would go up to the price that the market demand curve bears to set the price, so there's our price. And then again at the market uh, profit maximizing quantity, which is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, we look and see what the costs are there. In this case, the average total costs are here. So price up here is lower, excuse me, higher <laughs> than average total cost. So there are profits, P minus ATC times quantity, just like we did before. Okay, so what's a little different now is there is a long run adjustment and it's gonna look different than in perfectly competitive world. Um, new firms will enter the industry if there's profits. Uh, so what we're seeing here is new firms will enter. That's what we saw if there were profits in perfect competition, that shifted the supply curve. In this case, the adjustment is going to be that it reduces the demand for this firm's product. So profits act as a signal, firms enter. Rather than having supply adjust in the long run, what's going to happen is demand is going to adjust. As more firms enter, each existing firm will have less demand for their product. The demand curve slowly shifts down to the left, and that's how we get to zero economic profits. So let's take a look at what that looks like. It looks like this. Okay, so what's going on here? Marginal cost equals marginal revenue. There's the quantity that we would produce at. When we go up to the price, lo and behold, it's the exact same as the average total cost. So this is monopolistically competitive firms in the long run, zero economic profits, because price equals average total cost at the profit maximizing quantity. Notice we are not producing at the minimum of the average total cost curve, so it's not productively efficient like when we were in perfect competition. Now we didn't go through this with the loss. Let's just do a little thought experiment. What if we had had a loss? Well, we'd still set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost in the short run. We'd go up and see what price was being charged on the demand curve. What would happen is the average total cost at that quantity would be higher. So that loss in the short run would make it so firms would leave. Back in our perfectly competitive world, that would mean that supply would shift to the left. In this monopolistically competitive world, what that would mean is demand curve would shift to the right. The existing firms would have more demand for their product as other firms were leaving. And again, we get back to zero economic profits. Okay, so your book and the slides that I've posted in the files goes into this more in depth. Um, the key here is combinations of characteristics from perfect competition and monopoly, zero profits in the long run, more realistic, advertising can happen. 
uh, flat demand curve. Let's go ahead now and take a look at oligopoly. I know I'm going through this quickly um, and I'm sorry. Please feel free to come to office hours, uh, look in the slides, in the files. So what is oligopoly? Okay, so this is going to be towards the spectrum more like monopoly and we've talked about this in class. It's relatively few firms. So definitely not like a monopolistically competitive firm or perfect competition. Some big firms, two or three, maybe four, um, and they have interdependent decision making. Because there are so few firms and they're big players, each firm looks at what the other one's doing when they're deciding about hiring or pricing or supply. So that's what we call interdependent decision making. There are substantial barriers to entry. That's similar to monopoly, right? So there can be profits in the long run here. There you go. Profits and oops, didn't mean to do that. Sorry, everybody. And there's going to be shared market power. So with Monopoly, there was one firm, and they had control over the market. Here, these few firms have control. Now, for better or for worse, we don't have a way to graph these. So this one is different. We're going to look at some ideas called game theory to get a sense of how to predict what's happening in these models. And what are examples of this? Airbus, Boeing, you know, Coke and Pepsi, um, some of the big players, Facebook, Amazon, Google, you could think of them. So here are a couple of people, maybe you guys know, uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. So, ooh, I'm seeing this is going to be hard for you guys to see, so I'm going to try to push this up as we talk. Here we go. What is game theory? Okay, game theory is, and we've talked about this a little bit in class, it's what we use for oligopolies. So it's the study of how individuals and firms make strategic decisions to achieve their goals. And it's when they're taking into account other players or factors. So that's not something we've ever looked at before. When we were looking at demand and supply, we never thought about, hmm, okay, what should I buy based on what the other buyer is going to do? And we didn't say for a firm, oh, what price should they set based on what the other suppliers are setting? We just said, what was their cost structure like? And we looked at marginal revenue, marginal cost to figure out that quantity. So this really is different. So this is what game theory is, the strategic interdependent decision making. And there's a couple of things then that we can learn about with this. We can learn about the Nash equilibrium. And this is named after a famous mathematician, um, John Nash. Maybe you saw A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. He was the guy who thought of it. And he came up with this whole you know, mathematical equation for solving for this equilibrium. And he won the Nobel Prize for it. So what is a Nash equilibrium? It's when we look at these interdependent firms making decisions and we can come up with what their optimal strategy is. We can predict what their optimal strategy will be. And what it is is that looking at their decisions based on what other people would have done. Okay, so that sounds like gobbledygook. What can we do? We can say what is a dominant strategy? What a dominant strategy is, is um, looking at how other players choose their action no matter what the other player chooses. So a player will have a dominant strategy if we know they're going to do something no matter what other people will do. Let's take a look at that. So what we do is we create certain games. So how can we figure out dominant strategy and a Nash equilibrium? We have to kind of set up what's called a playoff matrix. So a Nash equilibrium, a great example is the prisoner's dilemma, where we could come up with what their equilibrium is going to be, the Nash equilibrium. And the problem in a prisoner's dilemma is that it's inferior to other outcomes. If they could cooperate, they could achieve a better outcome. That's why it's called a dilemma. And we see this type of game theory payoff matrix in many instances, where if they could cooperate and collude is what it's called, they could come up with a better outcome, either maximize profits or maximize gains. So where do we see this? Examples of this, trade barriers, political campaigns, um, legal disputes, pr business pricing. So your book goes through, and let's go through a simple example of a prisoner's dilemma with pricing strategies. So you can have Walmart and Target, right? Two big firms, like an oligopoly. Clearly, this isn't perfect competition. We know different brands, um, and they do have some control over price. So prisoner's dilemma might be an example between these two firms deciding if they should advertise heavily or not. That's what we're saying here. Advertise heavily or lightly. That would be an example. Because it costs money, and that's going to eat into their profits. So if Walmart decides to advertise heavily, ooh, that means maybe Target has to. Um, so they're going to look at what the other firm does. So let's take a look at a payoff matrix here. This is a payoff matrix, the one from your book. And the idea is that here's Walmart in blue. Here's Target. Let me see if I can fix that in red. What if Walmart decides to advertise heavily? 
So what we do is we look at in blue, if they advertise heavily, they can either make a payoff of 50, let's call it billion, if Target advertises heavily, or if they advertise heavy and Target advertises light, Walmart can make 120 billion because they are advertising more than Target, so they get more people coming to their store, they make more money. And we could do it for Walmart advertising light, if they advertise light, but Target advertises heavy, look, Walmart will only make 30. What if Walmart decides to advertise light and Target advertise lights? Then they both make 100. So what these are are called payoffs. These are the different possible outcomes in each one of these scenarios. And can you see how it's interdependent? And the idea is that there's this prisoner's dilemma, meaning that what would be best for both of them is clearly in this box here where they're each earning 100. But sadly, because of the way the prisoner's dilemma works, when they look at what the other person's doing, if they can't cooperate and know on the natural, when they try to maximize their own payoff, taking into account what the other firm's doing, they end up with an inferior outcome, which is 50-50 here. So let's go through this. How did we end up at 50-50? Okay, let's pretend I'm Walmart again. I'm Walmart and I look at Target and I go, hmm, what if Target's gonna advertise heavy? If Target advertises heavy, Walmart could make, look in the blue, 50 or 30 if, if Target does heavy. So what does Walmart do? What would be the rational thing to do? It goes, okay, 50 is better than 30. I'm going to go with 50, so I'm going to go heavy. What if Target decides to advertise light? Here's light. Walmart looks at its payoff and says, hmm, I could get 120 or I could get 100. What's better? I'm going to go 120. So no matter what Target does, Walmart decides to do heavy. We could go through the same process for Target. Target's going to go, hmm, what if Walmart does do heavy? Target will look at its red. I could do 50 or 120. No, excuse me, Target would be 50 or 30. See 50 or 30 if Walmart's going heavy. So Target decides to go heavy. And then Walmart looks at what if, uh, excuse me, Target looks at what if Walmart goes light. Target's choices are 120 or 100. 120 is greater. So Target ends up going heavy. It's a lot of words, but the bottom line is they both end up going heavy. They both end up with a payout of 50. That isn't as good as the payout that they could have received if they colluded. If they colluded and they both said, let's not spend a lot of money on advertising, that just hurts our bottom line. If we both agree not to advertise, then we both can get more profits. That is the prisoner's dilemma. On the natural, if they can't go ahead and co uh, collaborate, they end up with a worse payoff. So the, the Nash equilibrium here is 50-50. That's their dominant strategies. They both end up in that box. And it's a dilemma because they could have done better if they colluded, which means coordinated. It's like the idea of prisoners being separated or you know criminals being separated into different rooms and trying to confess so they get the shorter term than the other person because they cooperated with the, uh, the police. That's why it's called a prisoner's dilemma. So there's lots of examples of this in your book, of different types of uh, game theory strategies and dominant and the trigger and the grim reaper. We're just going to stick with prisoner's dilemma. That's all I've got for you guys, although it's good to practice the other ones. And then the other thing to know in oligopoly is something called a cartel. A cartel is when a bunch of these firms come together and make an agreement to act as one firm. And they collude, they set the price, and they set the output. Doesn't that sound like OPEC? That's exactly what it is. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. They are a bunch of countries that want to take into account each other's pricing and output so that they can maximize all of their profits. So the problem with cartels, they're illegal in the United States. The cartels will reduce, oops, overall supply, and that raises prices. It increases their profits, but hurts consumers. That's why it's um, illegal. And so in a big, in an industry where there's a few big players, there is this incentive. They can negotiate and find each other. If it were a perfectly competitive world where there's lots of, you know, uh, firms, it's hard to coordinate. And plus, there's no way to di differentiate products. The problem with cartels, well, it's good for consumers, but for them, there's an incentive to cheat. You know, if you are OPEC, if you're Saudi Arabia, you can decide to all of a sudden flood the market. So you could try to put everybody else out of business by lowering price, and that's what's happening. So it's really hard for cartels to keep working together. All right, those are the main points of the chapter. Thanks for listening. Good luck, and be in touch if you have questions.